I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order and uh, move on to the acknowledgement of the traditional lands. The land upon which we work, live, and sustain ourselves is the ancestral and treaty lands of the Michizagig and Nishinaabe, also known today as the Mississaugas of the Credit, the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land. We also recognize the rich free contact history and relationships, which include the Anishinaabe and the Ongwe Hongwe. Since European contact, this land continues to be home to indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. As responsible community members, we value the diversity, dignity, and worth of all people. Colonialism displaced and dispossessed indigenous peoples of their ancestral land. And continues to deny their basic human rights, dignities, and freedoms. We are committed to learning true history, to reconcile, make reparations, and fulfill our treaty obligations to the original peoples and our collective responsibilities <coughs> to the land, water, animals, and each other for future generations. Thank you. Um, uh, the next item is approval of the agenda. So uh, do I have someone who would like to put uh, uh, Trustee Fumole and seconded by uh, Trustee uh, Johan. Uh, all those in favor of the agenda, so be it. Um, mm. Then we'll move on to declarations of conflict of interest. Do we have any conflict of interest? I've seen none. Uh, we'll move on to our staff reports. So we're going to move on to 5.1, the budget presentation from associates for information oral presented uh, by the principals, vice principal association, administrative staff group by, represented here by Neil Eccles. Neil, do you want to move closer to up here, the front row? <coughs> Go on, Mike. I have a mic here. I know, but... <laughs> We're a quaint, cozy group. Thank you, Trustee. Thank um, you. That th this submission is uh, on behalf of the administrator associations, so elementary and secondary associations, as well as OPC. And uh, at, when you get, I, I did submit a printed copy, so you should receive a copy if you haven't already. It starts off with a preamble that was taken from the um, report that the Toronto District School Board Administrators Association put together, which was a very good read. And if you haven't got a copy of it, I can gladly share one with you. So we have, uh, we're submitting in, in several categories. So one being an increase in principal or in vice principal allocations and supports. The next being mentoring, coaching, and development supports for new and all administrators, mental health supports, and then lastly, continued EA staffing support. So I'll read over just a, a few of the points and the rest uh, will be in writing. Over the course of the 22-23 school year, the Peel District School Board identified an increased need to support schools and communities with administrative staffing supports. In a year that has seen unprecedented school-based staff discontent, distraction, and disconnection, school administrators have been called out to bridge the growing gaps in school climate and the environment of unease at best to distrust at worst. This current school year has seen a distinct rise in the number of additional allocations for vice principals in secondary and elementary schools. So those are over complement the um, positions that they've added. Additionally, the board and OPC recognize school workloads for administrators has become increasingly complex. Thus, collaborate, collaborated to utilize the ministry system investment funds to, to support schools with allocations of short and long-term administrator support through the use of casual administrators and teachers in charge. Vice principals provide direct support and personal connection with students, families, and staff. This connection was described as vital when two grade 12 students addressed the newly promoted administrators at the recent lead sessions on May 18, 2023. Our future leaders emphasized the importance of caring administrators to their success. 
to maintain a school focus on equitable outcomes for all our underserved students and ensuring schools mm -hmm. are accepting places to be safe. And, and there is more information there, but the bottom line with that request is to look at uh, long-term and short-term supports for administrators in school with either <coughs> adapt, uh, adjusting the, 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 quote, the triggers or the allocations or with short-term relief. So mentoring, coaching, and development supports for administrators. The educational landscape is changing in complexity and at a rate that continues to expand. The ministry identified the dysfunction of the system and pushed for an overhaul. The result has shifted every way of doing business in and out of classrooms in this board. Combine that with the turnover of personnel at all levels, from teachers to custodians to senior leadership and trustees. The Peel District School Board has an identified need to develop its staff in ways and to a degree that is unprecedented. School administrators require capacity building for themselves and for their school communities. Not long ago, all new principals were matched with experienced retired coaches for their first year. New vice principals were paired with experienced administrators to provide guidance. These direct supports no longer exist for all, even though the role has become increasingly complex. Self-directed development is necessary with the support of a coach mentor in order to develop personal vision and the way administrators support their schools, mm -hmm. their students, their school communities, and moving staff forward. Board developed lead sessions are important for the development of the good for all realm of positional professional learning, but expanding partnerships between the board and the admin associations can support identifying and producing training and development. This path will require the focus, focus on capacity building beyond the basics and utilizing our casual administrators as effective coaches and mentors. Mental health supports. The mental health supports is very similar to what we've put in last year. We talked about the continued um, working in the world of the post pandemic, which now continues to significantly impact the social emotional development as well as mental health well being of many students, staff. We also talk about the fact that the system is struggling with providing consistent staffing in many schools and that then causes disconnect between students mm -hmm. and the people that are there to support them on a daily basis. With the other information we share, the, our proposals are increased access to mental health resource clinicians, to do capacity building with schools, families of schools and community members. We understand this means having more permanent people on the team to handle the counseling caseload. Child and youth counselors in more schools, decreasing the quote trigger to contact teachers from 300 grade seven and eight students to 250, as well as including grade six students in the count for the schools that are grade six, seven, eight. A decrease in the trigger for elementary behavioral education and education assistance, sorry. Supplement from 750 to 700. And did dedicated social workers for each secondary school. Additionally, we advocate for greater coordination of central supports, so everyone is working towards the same goals. Administrators are not pulled in multiple directions. Students require more supports in the schools, not centrally assigned. Direct student supports will come from an ISSP ratio that meets learning needs, not ministry targets, as well as reading invest interventionists or coaches in all primary schools. Lastly, we advocate for continued EA staffing support. As we all know, the care and support of, EA, of the care and support of EAs affect the most vulnerable of our students. Yet the ministry funding formula is outdated and inadequate to meet the ever expanding needs of the families that purposely come to settle in the Peel region. Whether for students in regional programs or integration into classrooms programming, EAs help ensure every student reaches their potential. Certainly, EA supports student safety, independence, and well being. But more importantly, EA supports students to thrive academically as well as socially and emotionally. We will never have enough EAs to truly support all students to their full potential, but we must have sufficient EAs to go beyond the bare minimum and refuse to accept substandard service. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. So can I have someone uh, put that on the floor? Um, Trustee Pamoli, seconded by Trustee uh, Davies. Do I have any questions uh, for uh, Principal Echoes? Yes, uh, Trustee Pamoli. Yeah, first of all, um, just thank you so much for coming and presenting to us today, and thank you for the work that you do. Um, I. I know it's been really tough, and this is something that I uh, hear frequently in my community is the concern about the allocations when it comes to these additional supports to ensure that you're all able to do the incredible work that you do with our kids. Um, so if we're, I wonder if you are able to share with us what the current formulas are, or if that could be clarified, and uh, following up to that, how you would suggest that we uh, move forward to better address the needs in terms of numbers when we're talking about allocations. So I don't have the, uh, I, mean, I do have, I do on my computer, but I, I'm happy to share um, after. But, but one of the, the pieces that happens every year is once the budget has been discussed, um, the school, if the, anyway, in, in our opinion, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't speak totally okay. that everything is, is factual, but uh, Triggers or allocations are often started on numbers, mm -hmm. and and how many and how many positions that can be enforced. So, say, is contact would be one. So, if your contact teacher is a special education teacher, that would then work with a number of students in a in a senior school, and contact would be allocated based on grade seven and eight students. Even though some schools have grade six and seven and eight, same with guidance counselors. Guidance counselors are in elementary or allocated by um, grade seven and eight students, even though grade six will, will uh, seek support. The other piece is uh, ISSP, so in school, in school support, special education positions, again, are allocated start to start with on numbers of students in the school, uh, as our ESL, English language teachers, are, are looked at with um, numbers uh, and, and levels of steps on the ESL continuum. But often those specific number, or overall global numbers and the global rankings do not identify the very specific needs in schools, but they're a starting point. And, and the starting point, we know we have to start somewhere. So what the request is that we look at those starting points is are, are there places that those starting points can be supplemented to support the individual and unique needs of schools. And the reality of the board is that we have as many individual circumstances as we have schools. Yeah. And we also recognize, though we recognize as associations, there must be a starting point. And those are the triggers. Does that help? Yeah, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I suppose then what the suggestion may be would be to start with the start with the initial allocations and then have that connection with the individual schools and determine if that's going to meet the needs and then go from there. And that's yeah. that's sort of the suggestion. And one example I'll give you is, is that uh, with EAs and, and the reason I talked about continued support of EAs is because Every year we are in a situation where the board hires an LTO, so long term occasional rather than permanent positions. And at the end of the end of June, those those positions end. Many times uh, the trustees and the board have been able to add LTOs come September. And it's then a matter of how many LTOs can be added or, or how many temporary temporary positions can be added to supplement the permanent positions. And we definitely understand that that is a continual process. Um, sure, in a perfect world, we would like to see all those positions continue on indefinitely, but we know that's not always possible. So looking at the supplementary pieces that go forward or start in September is, is a big support for schools. So are you, I don't, I don't know if you have these numbers, um, do we have a percentage of how many of these uh, support staff are permanent versus LTO? Like, is there a very big gap in there, or is that something that we? I don't know for sure, but my feeling last year that there was a, an endorsement of 
say for for EAs, uh, an additional between 50 and 100 positions that would have been added. Does that sound right? 100 last year. Would those 100 have met the need? I mean, that's it. It's a hard question because, of course, there's always more that can be done. Right? Yeah, I guess it, I, I, to be honest with you, I mean, it's like asking a food bank to meet the need. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I feel like I might have more questions, but I don't have them sort of compiled, so I will I will give up the floor. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> and just to add that point, we'll see a business case later on about, about 60 or 30, 30 EAs. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I think that's when staff, you can ask the real specific questions because they can understand the funding and the ratios. Uh, our our principal echoes, he's, he's on the receiving end of the allocation. Yes, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, do we have any other uh, comments or questions that we'd like to ask? Okay, Trustee uh, Bailey, please put your mic on and please ask, and we'll see what we can do. Great, Jack. Yeah, um, you mentioned that. You would like to see social workers in each high school in Peel. How many high schools is that? About 45, give or take. And no, no, it's not 39. 39? 39. 30. <laughs> <laughs> including, <laughs> including if you do the past, not past. Right, right. Like that. That's right. right. You're talking about typically 35 plus some other schools. Yes. Okay, thank you. So you're asking for 39? 39 social workers on top of the ele elementaries and middle schools? That we are? So that, that would, it would not require 39 additional as high schools already have a, an allotment. So it would be, uh, and I don't, on it, so I'll, I'll, I'm, as I, my position is elementary, I, I don't know what the, uh, allotment or the, the FTE is for uh, secondary schools at this time, but it would be a matter of bridging that gap between the current allotment and a 1.0. <coughs> Does staff know that yeah. answer? Uh, how many, what the allotment is for high school? No, not at this point. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> Well, uh, I'm going to have some. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, you know, uh, Principal Eccles, uh, for bringing your ass in. Your ass are really in line with what I've been hearing uh, from a lot of people, and I think it's it's really great. And and uh, and I appreciate you putting it out there for the trustees and the budget committee uh, to hear about it. I think one of the things that, as uh, you know, as trustees, though, when you make an ask. Uh, like we're going to just go in 5.2 through budget cases and we're going to see this is the ask and this is the money. And I, you know, and, and I'd like to support, oh, definitely EAs is one working from the laundry list up to the mental health, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, training, if you want to call it that, or, or the professional development but for new and ongoing uh, administration, et cetera, and go through that list. Have you put uh, our work with staff to try to put some numbers to that? So, you know, because as trustees, we'll get these business cases and we will have to vote on their acceptance, admission, or uh, or not uh, in the budget process. Uh, at this point, I was just going really based on previous submissions that have been submitted, but certainly in the future would uh, like the opportunity to take a look at the case uh, case model that staff put together, and and uh, you know perhaps there's something we can learn from to uh, develop that for next year. Well, I, I'd rather not just do next year because you're asked for this year, and I think the current. So I, I I I will ask staff: Is it possible for these asks to be put to some kind of uh, financial quantity so we can? Then say, okay, yes, we agree with the mental health aspect. We we'd like to put uh, hundred thousand or whatever that number is, or say, oh, they'd like ten, but we we can go five. You know, these are the tough decisions at budget time. Is there a way to to, uh, to put some numbers to some of these things? So to uh, chair, we'll work with Neil to see uh, 
if we can uh, bring some uh, some financial sort of impact off of the last class, we will do our best to, to bring that to, uh, to to the next or or the testing procession at some yeah. point before the testing make a decision. That would that would be benef beneficial because you know you have this ask, but we just don't know what you're asking for. And I think we're all, you know, I'm not going to speak for anyone else, but I think they're really great asks. We want to support everyone that is in need, and there's a lot of need in those asks that you have. But uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to any more questions before we uh, vote on the receipt of this oral report. Okay, yes, uh, the Trustee Bailey. Thank you, Chair. Um, what is being done with community, how much work is being done with community organizations? for around mental health. I'm afraid I, don't, I'm afraid I can't answer that. Okay. Yeah, so, so sorry, I'm just pointing to one yeah. so, question. So, you know, that would be something we would do in our, our um, I guess our special education group would be where that question could be answered with the, that staff. Okay. You know, uh, you know Principal Eccles represents the principal or the vice principal association. So he is he's not uh, my, my in charge of that. He's the you know mm -hmm. has the allocation for those people uh, in their schools mm -hmm. that manage that and then they do their their outreach if you want to call it that. And it could be done by the board, central board too, right? I I hear that, but I'm trying to understand if you're gonna ask for I'm in. Always asking. Um, in terms of what has been done, how are some of the mitigating circumstances that we have done, you have done, um, so that we, we um, mental health is huge and it's a lot of funding, <clears throat> but there's a lot of community organizations that do get this funding to work with children and youth. And so it's, you're asking, so I'm asking what's been done. Right, and so that would be a, a question for our spec ed to bring a report back and, and hear about that. And then, you know, it dovetails directly into not enough, let's fund more, or whatever action you would feel comfortable as, you know, presenting in the trustee supporting. But it is a good question. Any more thoughts? Okay, any more before? Trustee Clark. Oh. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, Trustee Clark on. on, on Online, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I just like to pile on uh, with previous comments uh, that uh, you know I, I want to support uh, you know any additional EAs we can, even if they're the uh, uh, FPOs. Uh, I'm not really sure what the you know uh, cost difference is. I think they were in the report, but my uh, honestly my computer won't work, so I haven't. Uh, I haven't had much chance to uh, to to look at the information except on my phone, which I can't really see well. So, uh, yeah, again, sorry. Uh, just uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I've been getting a lot of comments, from parents, uh, uh, EA sorry. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Trustee Clark. So, just uh, familiar with the process. So, we're going through. We're going to receive the business cases. We're going to go through that, and then. At the end of the day, the trustees will go through and have all that information for which we will then decide what stays and goes, which is probably a very, a very difficult decision uh, to be made when there's not enough money for the need that we have uh, if, that everyone brings to us. But, uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, without, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Principal Eccles, you wanted to have a comment? Just uh, one last piece of, and I, and I do know that, uh, that uh, Trustee Bailey, I do know that uh, a lot of schools do work with community organizations. Uh, sometimes we're also bound with the CARC, I forget what that stands for, there's so many acronyms. Community, I think. Acronym is CARC. Yeah, CARC. <laughs> but we're community um, agency, review committee, I think, something like that. So, so there is also uh, some limitations there at times. Um, so that we're aligning board services with, uh, with with community services, but I definitely uh, understand the question. And uh, um, lastly, I just want to reiterate that the this proposal was put together with all of the admin associations. So uh, for for anybody that's not familiar, uh, elementary has has a principals and vice principals <coughs> association. Secondary has a separate principals association. And the Vice Principals Association. 
And last, we have the OPC, um, which has an OPC appeal. Uh, and so the, all of the administrative groups have aligned to uh, collaborate on this presentation. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, sorry, uh, I'm here my associate director, Gil. So, through you, Chair, early on there was a question from Trustee Pinoli regarding the EAs, how many are permanent how many are. So, uh, this year, we have in total 2,226 EAs in total. Out of that, 100 are LTOs, the rest are all permanent. Okay, so the vast majority, oh, sorry. Vast, yes, vast majority are permanent, yeah. and then we hired about, <coughs> hired up 100. 100 yes. Okay. And just out of history, I'll add to that. Thank you, Associate Director Gill. I think normally what happens at lunchtime, we will convert LTOs to, to permanent, and then we'll add more LTOs. Uh, and just every year is different, depending on the budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, all those in favor of receipt of this uh, oral report? It's passed. Okay, we'll move on to 5.2. So we have uh, a bunch of business cases. Uh, I'll, I'll let the Associate Director uh, Gill uh, start the process with his uh, staff to uh, go through the process. And just uh, how do you want us to go through it? Uh, just a summary, or we're going to go through each one? No, we'll go through each. And do you want us to ask questions for, for each one? Yes. Or, okay, so as, as, we, point as we go through. <laughs> so, so trustees and uh, trustee Clark online, we're going to go, you know, each business case, if you have a question, let's focus the question on that, and then we'll go through it. And then if there's other questions at the end that aren't part of the business case, then we'll ask that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you uh, to, to you, uh, uh, Chair Tom. Uh, what you have in this report is, is the business cases that uh, different uh, areas of, of the board has, has put forward for consideration of, of the board as part of the 23-24 uh, year budget. Uh, we will have that opportunity actually going through each business case and, and, and as, as, as you mentioned, when uh, the folks are presenting a business case, there will be an opportunity to ask questions, uh, clarifications, and and then what our plan is is that at the next budget development committee meeting, we will be bringing forward a summary along with some financial impact of, of, of these 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 business cases as well as the availability of funding, so that, that the board has all that information uh, before uh, any decisions are made. So with that, I, I think we'll, we'll follow the, uh, the the way they are listed in in, in the summary of the business case, which is the, the first page of, of, of this report. So we'll go through that and then follow that, and then we'll start with uh, with finance, and that's the, the first business case. So Tanya, uh, thank you, and good evening, Chair. Um, so uh, I have the honor of going first. So. Um, and this business case, as you'll see, is um, more from the support services for, for our employees, and, and this is for our pension analysts. Um, so what's happened uh, this year, as of January 2023, OMERS, who provides the pension plan for the non-teachers group, uh, changed its regulations. And uh, prior to January 1st, 2023, uh, only full-time uh, employees and um, uh, uh, part-time employees that had a certain number of hours over a period of two years that, was, that were almost full-time could join uh, OMERS or the pension plan. Uh, as of January 2023, um, that changed, and uh, now the pension plan allows all employees, uh, regardless of their status, so casual employees, uh, regardless of number of hours worked or even how frequently they work, can now be part of OMERS. Uh, with that change, what what, what uh, was required is that we had to provide uh, all our current employees the options to enroll. 
um, which was a significant endeavor. So that was of January. We at that point we had to actually make the offer up uh, to 5,000 employees, which was uh, a significant endeavor. And uh, one of the things that we were uh, asked or required to do was also actually monitor not only the fact that we um, offered enrollment, we have to monitor uh, actual receipt of uh, individuals um, either opting in or out. Uh, so far, uh, when we, we, we had to um, make a, a mailing of 5,000 for 5,000 individuals, we have uh, currently signed on about 25% uh, of that, so it's about a 25% adoption rate, uh, which is significant. Um, and again, it, although that must, is a one-time endeavor, now we have those 1,250 people uh, ongoing. So once you uh, opt into OMERS, you, you don't opt out. So basically, once you're in OMERS, you stay there until unless you terminate with the employer. Uh, we are still waiting to receive about another 2,000 responses. Um, and so we know that number will grow, uh, as well as in the future if we have any additional uh, casual or part-time employees. Um, so although the sign-on was significant, we were very fortunate that the uh, director's office just all did agree for us to do with contract staff, at least for the sign-in pr process. Uh, however, now, now that we have these employees, there's going to be ongoing requirements for administration. Um, so um, that, that requires uh, signing in of ongoing. It also requires any time there's a break in service, there's specific things that need to be done when there's a break in service, uh, basically to offer those employees potentially to, to buy back some of their days. So again, to, uh, uh, to allow them to get more service within the owners. Uh, so the ask here really is um, for one additional uh, uh, analyst, uh, to support uh, this additional staff uh, requirement, because again, if we just we have to be compliant, um, and once we lose this contract individual, we will not be able to sustain that workload uh, within the department. Um, so happy to take any questions on that. Yeah, Jennifer, you want to take that? Yeah, I'm just going to take that one. Um, yeah, thank you. This work is currently being done by someone on staff right now. Is that so? It's a contract individual that uh, because when it initially happened, it was mid year, so we weren't able to go through the initial budget cycle last year uh, when Omer's announced it. So, so it was required as of January, which is just uh, this past January. So we do have a temporary individual uh, taking care of that. Uh, but once their contract is up, then we will not have nobody else to sustain that workload going forward. Okay. Through you, Chair. Now, since Omers has put this workload on us, is there any chance that they will help subsidize this um, employee? Because, I mean, they have created the problem. Um, we obviously, uh, it has impacted a lot of um, employers and uh, was told by staff there was actually a meeting this past week where even people were flying in from Ottawa to complain about it because this is a huge endeavor. Omers is not. Uh, um, supporting any costs. Actually, initially they were initially they promised us to support the mailing. Then they backed out of supporting the mailing of, of five thousand booklets that we had to print. And we actually had to print them and distribute them hard copy because again, it would not allow us to do anything electronic. So yes, um, and, and obviously people may ask why is Omar's doing it. I think again, uh, people know the pension plans as these type of roles are diminishing. They're trying to get more uh, individuals enrolled in, in terms of the pension. So. Um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, employers are complaining, but yeah, they're not going to support us with any costs. But if, if those protests gain traction, something that would, of course, spread right on the front lines to get the compensation. It, absolutely. Uh, but again, this impacts all the cities and everybody that have, would have to be in a more support. So yeah, there's a lot of people that are not very pleased with this development. Okay, uh, Trustee uh, Joe Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question: the enrollment is still on a volunteer basis. Uh, the enrollment, yes, uh, through you, Chair, yes, the enrollment is on a volunteer basis, but uh, OMERS, once you enroll, uh, so right now we know that 1,250 people have enrolled, so once you, they've enrolled and accepted, then they're part of the plan, and they can't, let's say, in three months, say, well, I, now I want to come out of the plan. So we know for sure we're going to be administering at, at least 1,250 uh, as, a, as a, the get-go, as if we still have about 2,000 current uh, mailings outstanding for response, and Obviously, as things progress, we'll be ongoing new employees as they join up as well. 
Is there a deadline? Uh, the deadline, as we said, the deadline to to send out the thing was on January, but we have, are, have done our due diligence uh, mailing it out. We are on our third round of mailings. So initially we had to mail out hard copy booklets. We have followed that, that up with uh, email. Um, and we're doing a third round for the last uh, just under 2000 shortly. So we have an obligation at least to to uh, ask if people want to be enrolled. So I understand the option remains available for each and every employee. If they don't enroll today, they can enroll in the future. After each year, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, they can. Uh, our obligation was to get them enrolled as soon as possible, but then if, if they change their mind, they can certainly re enroll in the future. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next, uh, next item, please. Thank you. So, through you, Chair, the next one in line is, is innovation and research. So, Superintendent so Chair Bennett. Good evening and through you, Chair. Uh, the first business case is 1020 for the professional library. Via YOD, e resources to empower modern learning, sustaining implementation of Ministry Directive 18 while supporting de-streaming, UDL, and right to read. The purpose of this funding request is to supplement the library support services, existing e-resources to better support both online and in-person learners. Peel Elementary Virtual School, 741 students plus staff. Peel Secondary Virtual School, 1,858 students plus staff. Peel Alternative School, 114 students plus staff. Peel International School, schools, students, 2,787 students and staff and adult continuing education, adult language training, which has variable school population. By providing equitable access to technology and tools, we aim to promote global competencies, create inclusive learning environments, foster learner ownership and agency, and support the principles of universal design for learning, or UDL. This will also help support the Peel District School Board's Together We Rise 2.0 Black Student Success Strategy and the Community Reconciliation and Responsibility Project through CRP, Black Student Success Strategy and the Community Reconciliation sorry, Project, as well as Right to Read Report. So Library Support Services provides essential support services to learners and educators alike, including access to a wide variety of resources, instructional materials and educators uh, to students and educators alike. However, the current budget limitations prevent us from providing adequate resources to meet the diverse needs of our modern learners. This funding request aims to address this issue by allocating 450,000 towards sustaining and expanding our e-resource offering. In terms of the scope, this funding will be used to supplement our existing e-resources and provide access to additional materials and software. Specifically, we invest in a bring your own device model, along, allowing learners to use their personal devices to access e resources both in person and remotely. These resources will be designed to support the principles of UDL, which emphasize providing learners with multiple means of engagement, representation, and expression. In sum, the Digital Human Library is a total of 167,206 and one cent annually, continuing from this year. Take action for reconciliation at 129,176.25 annually. Destiny Discover Fiction Resources, 125,000 annually. Nonfiction Multilingual French e Resources, 10,000 annually. I can take any questions regarding this uh, business case at this time. Yes, uh, Trustee Davis. Might be more for um, just about the readings, Chair. Um, the, the students that are in the programs that are listed there, do we get a library allocation for those students through the ministry and our funding? Because I know that through for regular students, we do get a certain amount for every student for, to help with library costs. So through you, uh, Chair, yes, we do get some funding. 
thought, but, but not exactly uh, how much we get for, for the library sources. I'm not sure about that. But we do get some money. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just um, oh, sure. Thank you. Um, I noticed one of the bylines, nonfiction, French, English, and multicultural BYOD databases. I'm just curious as to what that is and what that database is. Could, could you uh, explain what that byline is? So these are databases where st teachers and students can access e-resources, both in French and in English. And I can get you actually a full rundown of all the resources that are available within there. And it provides those supplemental resources for teachers and students that may not necessarily be available um, within a classroom library. So these are resources that would be available throughout the entire district uh, for access by all schools. Wonderful. Yep, through you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, no follow-up. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Trustee Joe Hall. Thank you, through Chair. So in regards to bring your own device model, uh, learners, the students will learn uh, be um, allowed to use your, their own devices, but uh, uh, as the existing environment because of the devices in the school schools, some schools are asking parents and students uh, like they are implementing cell phone policies and asking the students not to use it in the school. Uh, uh, until the, they're asked to use it by the teachers. So now uh, from this, I understand that we are turning around and starting in, in encouraging students and parents to bring their own device. But parents can buy now devices for their kids. But I've been hearing from last six months that uh, parents should avoid buying cell phones for their kids because that is not either from K to May 12. Thank you for the question and through you, Chair. <clears throat> Sorry, um, if I understand the question co correctly, you're asking about BYOD, bring your own devices, and that there might be mixed messages out there with regards to uh, whether <laughs> students are encouraged to use their own devices or not. Um, it is my understanding that, thank you, it's my understanding that we do um, enable students to bring their own device. It also provides a more equitable access to technology with regards to, for students who may not necessarily have access to tech, Within uh, each school, each classroom, there's a certain number of resources that uh, the school would be able to afford and purchase and continue to build their inventory over the year. And for those students who are able to access their own and bring their own devices, that would support other students who are not able to. And so we do encourage the use of uh, personal devices and other devices while maintaining uh, the rules and regulations of the board's policies for use of personal devices in classrooms. So we do have strict guidelines that students are asked to abide by when using devices, and certainly these are for instructional purposes only when used in schools. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, trustee, uh, Alice. Through you, Chair. Sorry, that uh, <laughs> Trustee Joel Hall's line of questioning is part of the question. Uh, not, I don't know if budget is the appropriate forum for it, but in that BYOD policy, uh, and I really don't think budget is the appropriate line for this, but how do we ensure uh, student data privacy or our network uh, security through devices that are brought onto campus using, uh, you know, open source Wi-Fi network like a, something a school or a PDSP building? Thank you for the question. And through you, Chair, I think that's a question that would probably be best answered by our LTSS, our Learning Technology Support Services folks. I'm not sure if they're in the room. I think that would come under the Fiscal Planning Committee, I believe, is where LTTS yes. would be coming in. So maybe we can that question. Yeah, it'd be a shame to buy something and we can't use it because it's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
I hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, seeing none, move on to the next uh, case, please. Okay. Thank you, and through you, Chair. The next uh, business case is 1031, Financing and Software Licensing. Uh, and this is for our research department. So increasing the ability for the research team to support system needs in board and school monitoring of the directives, the strategic plans, the board improvement and equity plan indicators by ensuring ongoing system access to desegregated data, of both student achievement data and data about their well-being and schooling experiences. So with regards to the scope of this, the current estimate of costs, software and data licenses, more specifically Qualtrics, SPSS, Invivo, Esri, and Environics, Environics sorry, is 132,000. And these are tools that we use within the research department for these tasks. Translation of surveys to the 11 top languages within the district, $50,000. The current budget um, is MISA 81,660 and reviews and studies 6, 000, uh, 16,590. An internal review revealed that systemic racism and anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism and oppression of marginalized staff and students are presented in the Peel District School Board. Ministry Directive 9 calls on the board to implement a comprehensive annual equity accountability report card. This report card is the work of the research department and is a key accountability tool for monitoring and reshaping of learning experiences within classrooms and school communities. School boards are expected to conduct climate surveys with their students, which we're currently doing right now, parents and staff at least every two years. Additionally, they are expected to collect census data at least every five years. Experience has shown that a five year cycle is insufficient to meet the needs of the system. In order to collect these data, these data and prepare them, conduct analysis and report board and school level results accurately and efficiently, the research and accountability team require access to the software to collect the data and protect the participants. So through Qualtrics, conduct analysis through SPSS, in vivo and ESRI, Supplement PDSB collected data with other sources of data through Environics, OCAS, and QAC. Additionally, in order for surveys to be inclusive of our communities, translating them to 11 additional languages costs close to $15,000 for the large survey programs. So at this time, the total request is 93750 And I can take any questions at this time. See no questions. We'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. So we're switching to now the uh, equity side, uh, and that would be uh, Superintendent Hart. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McDonald. The following business cases outline the ways in which we will continue to support deep and sustainable change beyond the ministry directives focused on creating inclusive and identity affirming learning environments. So the first business case uh, is an Indigenous community engagement specialist. The rationale for this particular role is to increase community engagement and support relationship building among the Indigenous community and the school board. It is important that someone with lived experience and community connections is supporting this work across the system. Expected outcomes of this role is increased in community partnerships, with the Indigenous community, access for Indigenous students and families to work in community, centering community voice in the decision making around Indigenous education in the PDSB. And the impact of this work would be improved outcomes in self identification data, family, students, and community engagement, a rights based approach to Indigenous education, and educational sovereignty. And happy to take any questions about this business case. Yes, Trustee Davis. I noticed that we had in 2018 um, 666 students who identified. Um, do we have the newest numbers? I know that we just did a one, and I was just wondering if have those numbers changed or anything like that. And uh, part two of the question, I guess, um, might be for Mr. Um, Ball. I do recall that we did get some special funding for. Um, a role like this from the, the government. Is this where this falls under, or is this just a totally new um, uh, role? And 
when this comes to the actual um, to be finalized. Can we get an estimate on how much it costs us? So, so you, uh, Chair, we did, uh, in fact, uh, as part of the, the, the GSM announcement of the 2024, uh, we did uh, a significant increase in indigenous allocation and, and, and uh, uh, our whole part of our plan is, is this ask along with, with other work that we will be able to accommodate through that contract. And if I could respond to your question, uh, Trustee Davies, uh, through you, Chair McDonald, we are seeing an increase in self identification data. We haven't formally gotten those results through the student census, but the Indigenous education team are having students. Uh, willingly uh, self-identify, and I think part of that is because we have Indigenous student advisors as well as the center, where there are opportunities for students to feel safe to be able to self-identify. Let me just add to your uh, follow-up on your question, Trustee Davies. So, um, we, how many people have we uh, in our organization are focused on Indigenous and? Um, I, we have a coordinating principal, I believe. So currently the structure for the department yeah. is we have an indigenous leader right. as then we have an indigenous coordinator. Right. And then we have two resource teachers who are elementary and two resource teachers that are secondary. Right. And we have two indigenous student advisors. Student advisors. Yeah. yeah. And this person would uh, add to this team. And no one in that group is doing the community outreach and, and, and or doesn't, as you said, have indigenous background to support the, the outreach that's required. So currently the way it's structured in the role, we are partnering with indigenous community. We mm -hmm. have Tabitha who's working out of the center. Mm -hmm. We're partnering with other kind of, with other indigenous community members. The hope is to be able to have somebody who's part of the PL team that would support with building those bridges and continuing to bring kind of indigenous ways of knowing, doing, being into not just at the center, but across the system. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, Trustee Helps. Thank you, Chairman, through you. Um, I hope this doesn't come across like a silly question, but uh, just looking at this role and, and looking at the salary allocations, how do we come to those recommendations? Um, how do, like, how, how are they formalized? That's something maybe social director Bill would answer how the whole paper is yeah. determined. So, so through you, Chair, uh, for every new role in, in the board, uh, there is a process in the way uh, the compensation is determined. Uh, the department will put forward uh, the responsibilities, the education requirement for this individual, and other working conditions along with that will provide that information to our emotional state department. They do have the folks who, who specialize in, in, in compensation and they'll review that and based on that the compensation will be decided. Uh, regardless of how the business case gets approved. I mean there could be a high company or could be even a lower compensation. Gotcha. They, this ask is based on what the department at this time feels is it should be the compensation. Okay, that's great. Thank you. No follow-up. Thank you. It's a good, good, good understanding. Um, seeing no more questions, we'll move on to the next one, uh, 2075. That's our 1275. Thank you. Uh, so this request is for an Indigenous student advisor, and I did just provide the overview of the department. So this task would be for an Indigenous, an additional uh, student advisor that would be able to provide, so two, sorry, to be able to provide more support for Indigenous students, including, including planning and implementing a student advisory program, providing support for schools with students who self-identify, developing culturally appropriate programming and interventions. They're currently serving as an advocate for self-identified Indigenous students and supporting the system in, in school and closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous indigenous students as identified through Directive 9 data, as well as supporting graduation rates. Uh, we currently are also partnering with Algoa University and UTM, so looking for ways to continue to build out that partnership. And as the impact of that work that we anticipate is that 
increasing self-identification data that we'll see Indigenous students entering uh, specialized programs, as well as looking at increased opportunities for post-secondary pathways for Indigenous students. Thank you. So this is a two in addition to the two we used said already. Okay. Any questions? Yes, uh, we start with Trustee John. Just a quick question about the um, partnership with the GOMA. Uh, is it kind of cost sharing, or uh, repaying them something, or how it works? So perhaps uh, Superintendent Leone can speak to the partnership currently with Algoma. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so you would have seen the uh, news publication on the Algoma Gala and the excitement of the MOU agreement that was signed recently on May 12th. Um, just to speak a little bit about the uh, MOU agreement, we outlined some uh, budget investments. Uh, there's been some cost sharing. I'll speak to that um, a little bit. Uh, on our part, it's been quite minimal, uh, which is transportation mainly. Um, on the part of Algoma, um, there's been several hundreds of thousands of infrastructure that's been in place as far as um, securing the student engagement team, working with the registrar's office. Um, and so to Lisa's point, we are working quite heavily with our Indigenous uh, coordinators and the equity department to ensure that we have uh, pathways and transitions for priority students of Black Indigenous and other racialized, marginalized and underserved students. So the investment from a, a financial uh, perspective has been great on the part of Algoma. Um, and so we continue to kind of uh, partner in that way. Trustee, is that okay? Trustee Davis, you had a question? Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Seeing none, uh, can we move on to the next one? This is case 1032. Thank you. And so the next business case, the request <coughs> is for uh, 13 resource teachers. Uh, currently, as it stands right now, we have resource teachers who support across the system. <clears throat> These teachers will continue to work as cross-functional and interdisciplinary system teams to support the implementation of the ministry directives and beyond. The current structure is one um, resource teacher is assigned per superintendency. So in addition to their work on the ground in schools, we received 350 requests to date from educators, from principals across the system in terms of capacity building support. So they work directly with administrators and lead te teachers around creating identity affirming spaces, around cult culturally relevant and responsive teaching. Um, they're working to plan and design and support system-wide events and conferences across the organization, as well as the work that we do each month as it relates to Heritage Months. And so our expected outcome is that we know when school environments are inclusive and overall the curriculum honors and affirms the very identities of students we serve, it leads to an improved sense of belonging. So. Our hope is that we'll continue to see and work to create spaces where students' identities are affirmed, that their cognitive, social, and emotional needs are being met, and, and we'll continue to deepen educator capacity around the ways in which oppression operates and how we can work to address the disparities and disproportionalities as identified through our ministry review. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Trustee Bearden. Through you, Chair. Can you tell me how many resource teachers there currently are? So currently, uh, if I can speak to kind of each arm of the department, uh, I think specifically this ask was to support the equity resource teachers who currently serve and in the capacity of supporting all of the diverse equity needs across the system. So there are currently, uh, let me just check, approximately 15. Approximately 15. I can tell you the exact number. Okay. To add 13 more? No, so I would I would not be uh, next year. I have those resource teachers, if they were up until the end of June, their their contract ends. And so this would be for a request to replace them. Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Sorry, and I think Associate Director Kill was going to clarify that. No, no, no. Okay. Good. You provided that explanation, unless you need at least one. Okay, Trustee Alex. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, so just for, for clarity, those 13 resource teachers, would they travel about? 
So they're assigned per superintendent. So one superintendent would have one resource teacher assigned to them. And in particular instances, if required, I may kind of cluster them and deploy them to respond to a particular situation that may be happening in a school. I think that we look at how best to, to respond given the needs that may exist. Awesome, thank you. And just one more follow up on that. So I just want to make sure I got the numbers right. Are we going to less resource teachers than what we currently have? And if so, uh, why? So, through you, Chair, in this case, the, uh, the, the department has 13, these 13, and as, as Superintendent Hart mentioned, the, the contract ended at the end of June, and at the end of June. So, the ask is that uh, that we, we hire back these 13, oh, 13, 13 to, to continue for the next year as well. Thank you for the clarification. I was worried we were going down, and I had some concerns, but if we're just exactly one for one, we don't bring them if we approve it. Yes. That makes sense. TBD. Mr. So why are they on contract and they're not permanent staff? Just a So um, the way these 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 roles are funded, uh, they're part of the funding that that we see uh, as part of the the, the ADFO, which is our elementary uh, teachers creation, as well as the secondary. Uh, teachers' federation as part of their, their central bargaining or the collective agreement, uh, all school boards receive additional funding, and 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 we are using that funding to, to support these roles, uh, because the the the, the FO and OSSTF hasn't signed the agreement yet, the new collective agreement yet. So uh, the ministry is only providing this funding on a yearly basis. So we will continue to. Uh, because we're using that funding, so we can only make a commitment for, 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 for that, that one year because we only have the commitment from the ministry for one year. And one, once the new collective agreement is signed, and if this funding continues to that, then, then these rules will be for, for that many years. Good clarification. Um, okay, uh, seeing no more questions. Oh, sorry, uh, just a question. Thank you to the chair. Just uh, in uh, regards to the students who belong to specific communities, Muslim, South Asian, including Tamil, Punjabi, Sikh. Punjabi, Sikh, I would say, Punjabi, Sikh is Punjabi too, but what missing is, I believe, Hindu community here. So, sorry, Trustee Joel, just to clarify, is your question why Hindu is not represented in the listing of students yes. in that list? Yes. So, this list would have been identified through uh, Directive 9 as in terms of students who are under potential, you know, underserved and facing disparities and disproportionalities is where that list was generated from. Okay. Oh, okay. However, so just when we do we do interview, uh, we are thinking about you know equity resource teachers who can support the diverse needs of all students and their intersection identities, as well as kind of how faith intersects with them. Okay, but every Punjabi city is the same thing, is it not? Punjabi or Sikh? No. 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 I'm still thinking that, oh, sorry, that this community, the Hindu community especially, is growing community in my area especially. <coughs> and uh, I don't know if uh, we need to take some, something more so that this community is also covered. So thank you, Trustee Chopal, and through you, Chair McDonald, if, if the business cases are approved, uh, when we are creating that job posting, that's something that we can consider in how the posting is being drafted and sent out to schools. So thank you for the feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting job. 
Uh, seeing no more questions, we'll move on to the next business case, 1037. Yeah, Still me. Uh, thank you, Chair McDonald. And so the last request is for, for one additional graduation coach uh, to continue to provide specific support for Black students that lead to graduation to collaborate with secondary school teams and central departments to ensure academic well-being, engagement, and resources reach Black students, particularly in grade 11 and 12, who are at risk of graduating. So part of the work that they do is targeted academic interventions and supports, career opportunities during the school year and post-graduation, providing alternative modes to credit accumulation and school engagement support leadership and mentorship. And improved outcomes is an increasing in the number of Black students entering specialized programs, increasing in the number of Black students in various pathways, and increasing family knowledge of pathway options and opportunities, as well as the ideal goals and in improvement in graduation rates. Happy to take any questions. I'll just ask the question I asked before. Um, how many graduation coaches do we have now? <clears throat> so currently there are six graduation coaches and two are funded by the ministry until the end of 2024 and four are funded by the board. And they're all dedicated. Graduation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Trustee So just to clarify, this additional this is an additional one that somebody's contract that's really ended. So this would make it seven. This would make it seven. And it's across um peel. Yes. So is the question around how schools are identified? So currently, the way in which that we identify schools who will receive a graduation coach is by looking at student census data, as well as looking at graduation rates, and then thinking about kind of how best we can currently the graduation coaches support two schools. And so next year, the hope is to be able to build that out if the business case is approved, as well as looking at the ways in which we support transition at the seven and eight level, because we recognize that the conversation around pathways uh, doesn't just happen at the high school level. And, and just to follow up on that great question, uh, I, I, so what, you know, I, I believe you're saying, uh, from what I know, is it's we're not covering all schools. We're only covering uh, schools uh, use that have been designated as as through the various criteria you said uh, need a graduation coach. And the coach typically covers one or two schools. Two high schools. Two high schools. So right now we're covering 12 of the 35 plus high schools. Right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the uh, next item. Uh, business case. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Uh, saw the hand there, waiting. Uh, Trustee uh, Clark. Yes. Yes, I have a question uh, through you, Chair. Um, so you're asking for one additional graduation coach uh, to, to help with uh, Black identifying students. Uh, the other um, graduate coaches, are they focused on on any particular group, or do they have? Or I suppose the second question would be: Are there? Uh, do they have any training in that regard? Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Clark, and through you, Chair McDonald. If I understand, is your question around do the graduation coaches who currently are supporting students who identify as African, Black, Afro Caribbean, do they have specialized training? Uh, no, no. Uh, that the my question is, um, are there are there uh, of the current six graduation coaches? Are they focus on any particular group themselves or yeah. and do they have you know uh, any additional uh training themselves or a particular, so, you know any particular uh groups thank you for the question trustee clark and they do uh support the academic outcomes and well-being of students who identify as african black afro-caribbean and in terms of training, they are not, um, many of them are not educators. They come at the work uh, through the other capacities. So potentially um, BEAs, CYWs, they, they serve in 
diverse roles, and they do work in partnership with our Indigenous student advisors so that we're looking at ways to be gathering data to ensure that we're having the desired outcomes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Clark and Superintendent Hart. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, business case uh, 960. So that will be Superintendent uh, Hoppy. Hoppy. Is he online? Sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. I was having a technical difficulty there. <laughs> Through you, Chair, um, this is the Exploring Learning Gizmos. And Exploring Learning Gizmos will provide our PDSB teachers and students full access to over 450 virtual labs, simulation, simulations and STEM cases, which cover a wide variety of math and science concepts from grade three to 12. Gizmos are aligned to the newest Ontario curriculum to support our teachers and bring powerful new STEM learning experiences to the classroom. Each gizmo is accompanied with a teacher guide overview, student exploration activities, solutions, and supplemental resources to support highly engaging math and science lessons. Gizmos allow students to experiment and learn freely while creating a captivating and safe environment that com complements critical and computational thinking with inclusive, equitable, inquiry-based learning. Gizmo stimulations and STEM cases are designed for students at all stages in their understanding of math and science while encouraging growth mindset as they experience the Ontario curriculum. It's a particularly valuable tool considering that so many science experiences are difficult in time or resources to complete in a typical period of school instruction. This opens the doors for pre-instruction, parallel learning, or follow-up uh, after a lesson. It is really an invaluable resource for Peel teachers of science. Thank you. Any questions? Very self explanatory. Good. Okay, we'll move on to business case 977. And that is me as well. Mm -hmm. So, through you, Chair, um, I'd like to start. Uh, we would like to start uh, as a department of uh, highlighting a program in September to establish an off site school within a college program um, with the abbreviation SWAC or SWAC for short in partnership with Sheridan College and the Peel District School Board to provide equity for those who may be disengaged from Peel and or require a mature college environment to achieve academic success as they transition to post-secondary destinations. This program will provide an opportunity for students to receive four to seven high school courses and two transferable college courses to receive their Ontario Secondary School Diploma. Students would work with an instructional coordinator responsible for dual credits, the dual credit resource teacher, the transitions resource teacher, student success teams, guidance community, and Sheridan College as a partner to plan, support, and identify and implement the school within the college program for these students. Schools within the college students will be registered college students and receive a student number and ID card with access to all college services and events. Currently, Peel is the only board not offering a school within a college to students. The target is to identify early leavers, racialized or other spe specifically selected students between 18 and 20 years old, close to graduation. The focus is on community building and a tailored experiential opportunity with equal opportunity for all students. The format is a Peel teacher delivering two high school courses, with one being a credit recovery course and two being college credits. This can then be co-created to satisfy the unique needs of students delivering up to seven credits if co-op is also included. Students will receive individualized support from a college advisor through transition planning and, uh, and for post-secondary. Transportation, laptops and course fees are covered by the school within a college work initiative and nutrition programs are in place for students. Colleges have a Make Your Mark program students can access along with all college facilities, which are, again is free of charge. College fees are being waived for these students and students would be identified by school teams, including students from Peel Alternative Schools and students associated with the dual credit program. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, we're going to now move on to our next uh, business case 967. And so I think we're changing superintendents. Yes, so we're going to be superintendent. 
Good evening, everyone. Through you, Chairman McDonald, I would like to present the following business cases and the rationale for op optimizing our practices at the Welcome Centers, acknowledgement of, of staff needed for the center focused on affirming black students, which uh, the name has yet to be improved, and instructional coaches for improved literacy outcomes. <laughs> Business case uh, 967 asks for two casual principles. Administrative experience and talent are required to manage the three welcome centers. The three centers located in Malton, Brampton, and Mississauga have long since been running by a coordinating position, one void of administrative experience. To ensure these centers align with board priorities to address systemic barriers and equity of outcomes, it is vital that an experienced administrator provide oversight to ensure effective opera operationalization of policies. Casual principals bring a wealth of experience with administrative tasks such as hiring, staff evaluations, and monitoring. Casual principals are privy to training and have the experience of securing accountability and developing the organization for sustained practices. The We Welcome the World Centers must be guided by an administrator with full understanding of the needs of newcomer families and ensure equitable assessment of students to operationalize registration processes involved in and in, be involved in equitable teacher hiring, office assistance, student registration, immigration matters, and community needs. Business case 1016. Sorry, 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 Thank you for the sorry. thank you for the sorry. question, sorry. Trustee Davies, and through you, Chairman McDonald. These are two casual retired. So these two individuals would be retired principals. And they would only be allowed to uh, work for a maximum of 50, 50 days. Uh, so let me uh, follow up on that question. Thanks for bringing that, uh, Trustee Davis. So you said there is an existing uh, principal coordinating the three centers? There's currently a retired uh, principal working at this, supporting the three centers, yes. Okay, why does it need to be a principal? Can it not be a vice principal? It certainly can be a, a vice principal. Okay. So is that then put, uh, I think if that's the case, business case, it should be changed to say coordinating principal, vice principal uh, on there. Okay, thank you. Yes, the, the administrative experience is, is what we're really- What is needed, I, I, absolutely. And that's why I said it's a vice principal, because uh, there's more vice principals, I think, up there. Sure. Yes, Trustee Alves. Through you, Chair, I uh, just want to make sure I understand this correctly. I'm looking at the byline. I'm seeing total 137,396. Is that for 50 days? Did you say 50? 252. Oh, okay, so that's divided by two yeah. each of the days. Okay, but thank you for that clarification. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any other questions? Uh, then we'll move on to business case 1016. Oh, no, oh, sorry, sorry, I apologize. I have uh, Trustee Clark, uh, Superintendent. Uh, yes, Trustee Clark. Okay, that's okay. Uh, just to confirm, uh, you may have answered if got questions. Uh, so we currently have one person acting as a casual administrator. Is that correct? And you want an additional two? Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Trustee Clark. Yes, we have currently one person. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now we can move on to uh, the uh, next item. Uh, business case 1016. And who is that? Uh, Thank uh, you. Day? Okay. Thank you, Chair McDonald. Business case 1016 asks for one program coordinator for 
um, our Center of Black Excellence. The Center of Black Excellence, uh, as I stated, not yet uh, the name yet to be approved, asked for a program coordinator to be responsible for ensuring the programs provided at the center align with the We Welcome, We Rise Together 2.0 uh, Black Student Success Strategy. The role will require coordination with the coordinating principal of African, Black, and Caribbean students. The coordinator will ensure programs meet the developmental needs of Black students, provide professional learning opportunities for staff, and welcome Black community service providers to support families. Program offerings will include, but not limited to, book clubs, STEAM, op STEAM opportunities uh, for artistic programs like steel pan, art and music, guest presenters, etc. The coordinator will work with two resource teachers, one with elementary, the other with secondary qualifications. He or she will liaise with the equity department to identify community partnerships that will work with and at the center. Programs in the center will potentially run Monday to Saturday to provide students and families with multiple opportunities to engage in uh, identity affirming work. A program coordinator will also ensure that the programs offered align with the mandates for the We, Walk, we Rise Together 2.0 Black Student Success Strategy. The coordinator will ensure that the program offerings advance the principles of anti-Black racism and anti-oppression work. They will ensure students are provided with rich opportunities for engagement of Black history and the impact of historic and contemporary realities on the lived experiences of Black people. The curriculum will be situated within a culturally responsive and relevant framework and ensure age-appropriate programs. Lastly, the program coordinator and coordinating principal will work together to ensure board policies and practices are adhered to and that the community partnerships are developed and maintained. I'm happy to take any questions. Do we see any questions? No? Okay, we'll move on to the next one, which is uh, 1017. Thank you, Chair Donald. The vision for the Center of Black Excellence is to be inspire expressions of Black joy and Black excellence throughout the PDSB community. Resource teachers will work in collaboration with program coordinator to ensure that the Center creates opportunities that inspire Black joy and Black excellence. The resource teachers will provide students with curricular opportunities to exercise agency and ownership. All students in the PDSB community will be included in opportunities for entrepreneurism, leadership, development in and out of school, mentoring, book clubs, career choices, all with an aim to, ident to be identity affirming. Programs at the center will leverage the African, Caribbean and Black histories, languages, brilliance and the rich cultural heritage of these diverse communities. All Peel students will see that the value of Black people within the Canadian and the global context requires an activist mindset and effective advocacy skills to ensure anti-oppressive environments. Black students will experience a sense of pride, while others will have institutional agency to champion the brilliance and cultural capital of Black people. The ministry directives of 2020 outlined 27 directives to guide the Peel District School Board towards creating and implementing policies and procedures that are anti-racist and anti-oppressive. The chief mandates of the Center of Excellence are found in the We Rise Together 2.0 Black Student Success Strategy. These mandates affirm the Black identity, recognize historic and contemporary realities. The resource teacher will also provide programming opportunities to inform decision making uh, on staffing and resources inspired by the strategy. The center will fulfill a need for the black for black excellence to flourish across the PDSB. Happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Any uh, questions, comments? Um, I see none. So we're going to move on to business case uh, 1039 now. They're very similar, uh, 1039 to 1043. Uh, maybe it would be good to just group them together and just summarize them as a group. Uh, and, and who's presenting that? Is that, is that Superintendent Day? No, yeah, be so, myself, uh, Superintendent uh, Hoppy. Okay, Superintendent Hoppy. If, if that's okay, maybe we can group the four of them together. I think they're all relatively asking the same thing about 
uh, instructional coaches through the various different grade categories. Yes, so and thank you. So I'm going to group. I'm going to group 1040 and 1042 together. That's 30 okay. plus five instructional coaches for kindergarten to grade three. OK. So thank you, Chair. As a result of the Schools and Better Student Outcomes Act, we have been allocated ministry funding for grades K to three for literacy to support the recommendations in the right to read report. These 35 instructional coaches will be leveraged to support identified schools. The right to read report highlights that 95% of students can learn to read when provided with structured literacy. Learning to read and write with the English language requires systematic and responsive research-based instruction from skilled educators. However, since 2006, all educators have been expected to teach reading curricula using what is known as the queuing system. The queuing system is not considered an evidence-based approach to teaching reading according to a large academic body of research known as the science of reading and the recent right to read report. And the Ontario Ministry of Education is calling for a complete shift away from that system when teaching students to read. This shift is significant as it requires educators to relearn how to teach reading using new evidence-based approaches, strategies, and assessments that are developmental, developmentally appropriate. This role is a critical component of the board's larger plan to shift teacher practice in reading instruction by also leveraging culturally responsive and sustaining practices. Coupling evidence-based practices in reading with evidence-based practices in math serves the Peel community in deep and impactful ways. While we appreciate the ministry's funding to serve students in kindergarten to grade three to develop their literacy skills, there remains a gap in grades four to six literacy and a gap in K to six numeracy. We'd like to add an additional 10 instructional coaches to this business case to close those gaps in elementary literacy and numeracy. Happy to take any questions at this time. I'm going to jump in first here. So the way you presented it, and I'll maybe direct this to Associate Director Gill, there's been special funding now for these positions. So um, is that documented? I didn't really see that in you know, in the past we say it was, you know, it's mandatory and there was funding allocated in the new budget for this or not. So is that a business case or is this a requirement? Anyway, uh, sorry, two questions. No. So, so, you, uh, man, Chair, man. so uh, yes, it is correct that uh, the ministry is providing additional funding as, as part of uh, their GSM announcement uh, for, for these additional uh, coaches. Yes, they are. And, and 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 what I ask, I think, is that there's an additional 10, ten okay. uh, in, in addition to these. Uh, but we will also still want to make sure that 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 the board is is aware of, of this additional funding okay. and that how the board is, is using that funding. So that's why the teams are including the business case. And our plan is that at uh, the next uh, committee meeting that we will be bringing a summary of all the business cases where we will identify where there is already additional funding that right. can be used for certain business cases and and where right. the board need to use the, the other funding to support the business case. So, so we will provide all that information at the, at the next meeting. Awesome. Thank you for that clarification. That was really helpful. Any questions? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move on. To, uh, sorry, uh, Trustee Clark. OK. Okay, just just for clarity's sake, this uh, these ten instructors are for a currently not existing position, correct? Or are these additional? And if that is the case, how many do we currently? Have? So, I mean, uh, so we can they can they can add, but but all these these roles thirty five plus the additional ten, these are all new roles. Okay, so there are 35 currently, you're saying, you just want... No, oh, 35 do. What we're saying is that the ministry has provided funding for next school year for 35 ICs, and the ask is now for 45. So so that means we will, the, the board has to, to come up with, with the funding for the additional debt, if it's okay. approved. I hope okay. that clarifies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Clark and Trustee Ellis. Thank you, Chair. Three, Chair. 
Um, why would, so I'm guessing we, we obviously went through, someone went through a business case that came to the conclusion that we needed 10 more than what was being provided. Um, did we ask the ministry why they didn't give us money for what we need if we, if this is part of a directive, we came from the directive, do we have clarity there? And if not, can we get it from them? I'll start uh, through you, Chair. Uh, this is uh, this is not necessarily part of the directive. Uh, this funding is being provided to 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 all school boards in Ontario, uh, and the ministry, uh, for their own rationale, uh, had decided to only fund for K kindergarten to three. Whereas, as we as, as a board and staff feel that that I think we need additional resources to support uh, the, the I think a four to six as well. Yep, uh, not a member of the committee, but through you, Chair, uh, what, what I would imagine is, you know, given uh, our unique position and that we have come to this conclusion, maybe that uh, is something to explore, uh, having the ask if it's there. Sure. We, uh, through you, Chair, we, we can always pursue with the Minister to see if 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 we can ever see additional funding. Definitely, we can do that. No. Usually, uh, something like that is a big ask, and we would have the whole board uh, yeah. for sure to make a uh, motion to send the uh, ministry of, uh, Minister of Education a letter say, This okay. is a great initiative. Please, we can, what's the rationale like it, that we can't double it or whatever, yeah. or we recommend doubling or something? Okay, that works. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll now uh, hand it over to uh, Superintendent Hoppy uh, for his two items there from the 7 to 10 grouping, I guess. That is correct. Thank you, Chair. And through you, so the curriculum instruction and assessment department serves elementary and secondary schools to ensure the Ministry of Education directions are fulfilled through effective instruction and assessment practices. The ministry has recently released new curriculum in both elementary and secondary panels, specifically in the subject areas of literacy, numeracy, and science, with other subject areas scheduled to be released over the next year or two. These instructional coaches uh, will provide job embedded coaching support as educators make this significant shift in their practice and to provide coaching and support to build educator capacity in creating anti oppressive learning environments that center relationships and value children's unique identities. Our unique context and appeal also requires us to ensure that this shift is embedded within the framework of culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy to uphold our commitment to the academic success of Black, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit students, and all who have historically been marginalized by the education system. And this includes English language learners and students who are identified with having language learning disabilities with prevention of that identification might have been possible with frequent, intentional, and explicit instruction. Specifically, the instructional coaches will focus on the streaming and transition support for those who, and will, sorry, and will prepare students in grades seven and eight prior to transitioning into a D-Stream grade nine uh, program and support grade nine students to be successful in the D-Stream grade nine classroom and in preparation for grade 10 and their senior program. A total of 58 instructional coaches for grades 7 to 10, based on the ministry funding as outlined in the report, is what we are requesting. And the report of the coaches will be job embedded professional learning that will focus to align with the school improvement and equity plan goals of middle and secondary schools. Transition support for students will continue to be part of our collective commitment to support student success. Instructional coaches will contribute to school specific needs based on the school improvement and equity plan and will use consistent processes developed by central teams to support student learning. Happy to take any questions. Mm, seeing no hands raised, uh, we're going to move on, I guess, to the next uh, item, which uh, changing uh, presenters. We're going to be going to uh, school partnerships and that will be presented by Oh, that was stupid in that Leone. Yes, Leone, if you could present that for us, thank you. Thank you. So representing the Leadership Capacity Building and uh, School Partnerships uh, Department, uh, thank you, Trustee McDonald. I'm here to present two business cases. Uh, business case ID 974 is the first one. So School Partnerships um, is a new mandate, fairly new since February 22. Um, uh, that's a new added responsibility in the department, and mainly we focus on building partnerships with private and public uh, institutions. Uh, you would have seen the CAUTM, Oklahoma, and TMU as three examples that were um, um, uh, published in the media. Um, and so the partnerships really have been focusing on, um, you know, um, having students acquire university credits while completing OSSD and co-op. Um, which is high school, 
um, employability skills and micro credentialing. Uh, we are requesting sixty thousand dollars to cover funds for program programmatical reasons, uh, transportation. Um, sometimes we've had to secure some weekend permits. Um, at, for instance, Brampton Venture Zone. Um, as one example, we provided honorariums for uh, instructors from universities, um, senior university students who work with our students. So um, this would be a little bit of a, an investment um, and a cost sharing uh, opportunity with some of our industry partners and private institutions that are supporting our students in their learning. Awesome. I can take any questions regarding this case. Any questions? Seeing none, no hands. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, business case 975. Correct. Um, the next one is um, a request for full time office assistant mentor floater. Um, so currently, according to HR data, we have about a thousand permanently hired OAs, um, and there is a need for capacity building and uh, professional learning. Um, especially in the area of operational needs with um, our frontline staff, which we know are is crucial in, um, in receiving parents and, of course, uh, fulfilling their job duty. Um, this particular um, OA mentor and floater would work um, particularly one-on-one -on -one, um, in some cases and also a build capacity with um, the office managers in, in building skill set for OAs and also in thinking about staff engagement, staff retention and succession planning or OAs will be eventually promoted to OM roles. So building capacity at that level is really crucial. Um, and we see this as a really strong need uh, based on what we're hearing from office managers and school principals directly. That the need for training, professional learning capacity work for OAs is a requirement. Thank you for that. And I do have a question. Um, we, you know, this is always across our entire portfolio, you know, elementary to high school, but the roles are different. A high school role is much different than an elementary role. Correct. You know, so how do you cover that disparity of having a floater which may have an elementary experience and not have high school experience? Uh, we found that with some um, experienced OAs, uh, they work in both panels. Okay. Um, and so the intended hire, um, would, we would probably build that in the job description. Okay. Uh, they would have perhaps, uh, from my understanding, I was not here uh, in the past, there, what, there were a couple of OA mentor roles in LDSS, the previous department. Um, so um, I, I thought I would start with one request uh, and see how that goes. Um, but we're hearing from principals directly right. and from office managers directly that this is uh, a huge need. And I see this shaking down the principal in the back. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? I think we can move on to the next uh, group of uh, of items and um, I don't there's four asks here of EAs and BTAs no, no, no. or sorry about that yeah safe yeah. schools response yeah. so I apologize sorry okay. excuse me sorry. nine seven nine yeah thank you and uh three you chair the three business cases that I'm presenting today are all intended to um, ensure positive and healthy climates in our schools. Uh, the first one is around uh, a writing team. We've already had writing teams for consent culture for grades 4 to 6 and 9 to 12. And these writing teams will develop educator toolkits for use by teachers in the classrooms. Um, each writing team that we've had previously has developed a set of resources and learning experiences uh, connected to consent, and the learning experiences are also connected to the Ontario curriculum, the Black Student Success Strategy, and the EML Knowing and Doing Guides. Our consent culture team within this department has strategically and intentionally developed an intense implementation and communication plan to ensure that this work lands on students' desks. 
and our elementary educators and administrators are asking for more. They're asking for resources and learning specific to students in the early years, kindergarten to grade three, because the prevalence of non-consensual interactions in our schools is high. It's important that we continue to grow and evolve our progressive work around consent culture within the board. The next phase of our plan uh, needs to focus on the early years. And in order to keep our students safe, consent culture is uh, consent education is necessary. And of course, it looks different at each developmental stage. In the early years, consent education does not involve talking about sex, rather, it's about permission. And so when young children um, uh, have education that focuses on body awareness, personal space, body autonomy, and respecting boundaries. Uh, we feel that, um, you know, we want to be able to give our, our students the language and the tools necessary um, so that they can engage in healthy relationships with their peers uh, from kindergarten that will last into adulthood. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, we're going to move on to uh, the next budget item, which is 984, Safe Schools. Thank you, Chair. And for you, uh, with your permission, I'll combine the first oh, and the next two. Okay, perfect. Um, so, so the big task is around the state schools response team. And, uh, you know, Peel has taken a really proactive stance on reducing incidents of violence and concerning behavior in all of our schools. Despite our best interests, we remain concerned with the behaviors that we see. And we are committed to supporting every school in creating and maintaining learning environments that are caring, safe, equitable, and rooted in the respect and dignity of all students. It's also very important to note that we have many, many brand new principals and vice principals who could really benefit from our support. Our department is requesting a team of 14 staff, uh, a trained, organized team of professionals with differing expertise, whose primary responsibility is to be responsive to school teams who require assistance in responding in a timely and appropriate manner to incidents of concerning behavior. Um, I, again, being responsive to individual school needs, uh, we will provide short-term intervention that will include immediate, short, and long-term support um, so that we can have healthy, safe climates in our schools. As per policy 48, every school is required to establish a safe and accepting school team that works to foster the environment uh, in which all students will thrive, reach their potential, and experience a sense of belonging. Uh, we have to support school admin to eliminate incidents of violence, hate, racism, and discrimination. Uh, this work would be connected to the SEAT and the Bullying Prevention and Intervention Plan and the Board Code of Conduct. Uh, we will work with schools to build capacity, to create positive relationships, learning environments, building a sense, uh, sense of community and belonging. We firmly believe that building capacity immediately, on site, being both proactive and reactive will have the positive impact we need to ensure effective teaching and learning and ensure community confidence in our schools. And the second proposal really is um, for a writing team. Um, to uh, to gather and collate our um, resources, and we want to be responsive immediately to any need come September. So if we had a writing team over the summer, uh, come September, we would be ready to go. And the package outlines the content around, you know, the code of conduct, digital drama, vaping, eliminating hate, racism, discrimination, and really building communities of joy and repair through restorative justice. All the resources will center student identities and lived experiences and be tailored for uh, various grades and special education needs. As per policy 48, the team will so focus on creating communities, reinforcing desired behavior, social emotional skills, healthy relationships in alignment with D21, policy 48, the Black Student Success Strategy, and the EML Knowing and Doing Guides. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? So I, I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, what are we doing now? Why do we need 14 uh, with this covering vaping, et cetera? Is that not being covered now? Or? Uh, thank you, Chair. It is. Um, 
the Safe and Caring Schools Department is fairly re reactive at this point, and right. we do we spend a lot of time helping uh, school administrators with their investigations. Uh, we have two coordinating principals for 259 schools. So this team could really um, assist on the spot before things happen, when we feel uh, that the agitation is happening, to go in and provide some uh, proactive supports. And this would be only a one-year thing, and then that would be all the writing's done, or this is a permanent thing to have? Thank you, Chair. We're hoping that uh, the writing team will start us off, and then we can add resources, update them uh, as we go. So this would be, you know, you 14 people, let's say the, the second business case, that's only a one-year ask, and then that's, and that's it, not continuing. And I think when we've done the reporting in previous business cases, we really have a column that yes. says one year, one year or, or yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item is uh, special ed and social emotional learning uh, pass. Um, and who will be presenting those? Uh, Jennifer Newby, I think, or Superintendent. Okay, Superintendent Newby. Um, the first four are related to EAs and BEAs. Um, I don't know if it can be combined at all, but you know, but I'm not belittling at all this the need. But I, you know, I see the, the similar ask across all three, four of them, and just maybe you can summarize them all. We certainly have an individual business cases for us to read in more detail if need be. Thank you so much, um, Chair. We're just changing the volume. Uh, just be a sec, we have the volume button here. Okay, please continue. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Chair McDonald. I was going to um, share. Um, that the special education and social emotional learning department requests approval of these business cases in alignment with our commitments to addressing anti ableism, the ministry directives, equity, justice, capacity building, compassion, and dismantling of oppressive practices. And so before the 20 business cases uh, are shared in this presentation, they have been grouped within common themes to bring clarity to the rationale for the cases and avoid unnecessary repetition. So we'll hear first about business case 983, 985, 986, 987, 989. LTO, Educational Assistance, Behavior Educational Assistance, Transition Educational Assistance. Educational assistance are an essential resource and support activities of daily living, including toileting, feeding, and development of socio-emotional skills to promote student safety and well-being. They also participate in supporting transitions to learning and within the learning environment. In regular meetings with union and association partners, we continue to hear that schools would benefit greatly from access to an increased number of educational assistants. The goal of student independence in whatever form is possible for each student requires gradual release of responsibility as students make anticipated gains in accordance with the goals set within their individual education plan and in consultation with students, staff, and parents. That is the first five business cases. I'll pause here for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I do. Uh, thank you for that. And, and I think, you know, the need, we heard that earlier in uh, the order report from uh, the Principal Vice Principal Association today, that this is a definite need. We also heard a comment about LTOs. I see these are all LTOs and there's nothing here to make any permanent. So, may I ask the Associate uh, Director, Gil, 
what's the rationale to just uh, to not convert some of the previous ones to permanent or maybe uh, make these only LTO? LTO? Uh, through you, uh, the rationale behind uh, continuing with, with 100 LTOs is that uh, the board is using the, the, the reserves to fund these, uh, uh, these positions. So, so uh, I, I think it's always advice uh, law, uh, so the board can continue to make that choice or, or use that funding for something else if, they, if the need is. So because of the reserve funds, uh, uh, the ask is continue to be an LTO. And as I indicated, it's only 100 out of the over 2,000 uh, EAs. Yeah. And it, so to confirm that, this is not 100 then, this is just continuing the 100 from right. last year. Right. So we're really not increasing the EAs with this process. They, it's just to maintain what we did yeah. in the previous school year. Right. Okay, I, I really appreciate that clarification. It really gets home. Um, any other um, comments, questions, for trustees? Um, please uh, carry on, the superintendent. No, no. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, yeah. Trustee uh, Joe no, I was just uh, wondering because um, the school, the schools I have visited during the last five months, um, I have not seen, seen a single school that is happy with their EAs they have on hand. Each school uh, principal, they are taking help from them, some supervisors, and they have hard time to hire and retain EAs. And um, I don't know where the problem is, but I think we need some kind of uh, depth uh, analysis and uh, report on the situation because um, it's not a one school or a couple of schools. It's, it's, I think all over worldwide this same situation. So EA uh, shortage, I think we should um, um, be uh, the kind of feedback I get from the staff and principals that it, it lies in the kind of money, the kind of work EAs do, and the kind of money they make. So this is a reason that we have difficulties and to fight this shortage. So I don't know if we need to really um, have a status report and and have some ideas to really solve this problem. This is a big problem. I, as I have seen during the past few months. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Trustee Joe. I think it, it started to be raised over a year ago the, uh, in our board meetings, I believe. That was when it was to be asked. Um, but no formal request by trustees was uh, able at that point in time. But I, I think the right place for having that conversation and maybe put a motion on the board to have a staff report to. Uh, to is what you're talking about is the, the filling the positions and retaining the positions is what I understand you're saying. That has to go through, I think, the special education committee uh, where that can be uh, requested. Trustee John. I have uh, raised this uh, concern in the uh, special needs committee and uh, Catherine Lockyer is aware and uh, she has promised to bring the report. Okay. So perfect. Then that, that action is already processed. Great. Yeah. Because I think it's, uh, I think we all are concerned from uh, trustees to staff uh, to parents, etc. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, any other comments, questions before we move on? So uh, uh, Superintendent uh, Leone, uh, sorry, uh, uh, newbie, um, Jerry. Thank you so much, Chair McDonald. I'll move on to the following business cases, again, grouped to avoid repetition. So this is business case 990, 991, 992. Autism spectrum disorder, special needs itinerant, elementary and secondary, as well as permanent special needs educational assistant. These staff are utilized in the support of our ASD contained and ASD resource classes, as well as students in the mainstream, which is consistent with our commitment to inclusion. Providing opportunities for students to engage in the learning in a setting where there is consistent support is key. 
providing permanent positions wherever possible allows positions to be filled and maintained over the course of the school year. I'll pause here for any questions. Seeing no questions, uh, thank you for grouping those three. We'll move on to the next set. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair McDonald. This is business case 995, blind, low vision, itinerant teachers. Our students who have an identification of blind, low vision are supported by their classroom teachers with the aid of vision itinerants who provide direct instruction in communicating in Braille, using assistive technology, and developing the skills required for safe navigation and full inclusion in the school community. The itinerants have a caseload that is divided among students, depending on experience and learning needs, which we seek to balance to provide optimal support to students. We'll pause here for any questions about blind, low vision, itinerant teachers. Seeing none, if you can continue, please. Sorry, I have one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, Trustee Davies. Just the usual question. Um, do we have a number of the number of students that we have that identify as blind or low vision? <clears throat> I don't have that number here um, available. I was just focusing on um, what we have in terms of business case. I can return with that information um, shortly, but I would say that our focus is on maintaining a caseload balance so that we can provide timely support to schools. So what we're hoping for is a situation whereby itinerants can be with the students uh, more than one day a week, for up to two or three days a week, depending on the needs of the students. So we have a caseload system. So I can return with the specific number. Uh, we're working on those numbers right now for inclusion in the special education plan, which will be presented in three weeks at SEAC. So we're working right now on getting up to date numbers. Thank you so much for that. And, and, and I'll add that if we could put that in the business case, maybe that answer. So when we're seeing that, we know exactly. That'd be great. I appreciate that. We can move on to the next uh, set, please. Thank you, Chair McDonald. This is business case 996, 997, 998. Special education resource teachers. This admin sections for special education heads. Learning Support 1 and Learning Support 2, also known as Monitor Teachers. So these are grouped together because they're all secondary school supports. And as we've heard um, already shared earlier today, there are a lot of initiatives in terms of new curriculum and de-streaming that's coming out with relation to secondary schools. And they're in a unique position in terms of how special education supports are offered. So they are offered in a variety of forms, which is why we have three separate uh, business cases, all related to secondary special education. So secondary schools are embarking on a number of initiatives related to teaching and learning, as well as these three. Special education staff are engaged in efforts to build capacity within the system through offering the professional learning and providing instructional supports and accommodations, including monitoring related to supports for students with individual education plans. Additional staff is required to ensure timely delivery of professional learning and interventions for students who may require these additional supports. I'll pause here for those three. Okay. Uh, any questions, uh, trustees? Okay, thank you. I'll uh, we'll move on to the next. Business case 999, <clears throat> in-school support program teachers, also known as ISSP teachers. This in-school staff allocation provides direct support to students 
communication with parents, assistance with development of student portfolios, plans for entry, individual education plans, transition plans, and serves as a key participant and special education representative within the student review process. The SRP process is cyclical in nature and requires ongoing data collection and analysis, record keeping and case management. The addition of additional ISSP teachers for schools can expand the service capabilities of staff and ensure responsive and student-centered support. We're looking for uh, additional 13. I'll pause here for any questions around that. Seeing no questions, uh, we can move on to the next one. Thank you. I guess it's business case uh, 1001. 1001 and through you, Chair McDonald, 1001 and 1002, 1005, 1008. Okay. Those four have been grouped together and they consist of behavior consultant, social emotional resource teachers, social workers, child and youth care practitioners. The special education service model continues to evolve to support students' mental health and well being. The staff will assist the board to actualize the ministry and board commitments to provide direct service to students within the scope of education, as well as engage in development of key understandings related to destigmatizing mental health providing integration and inclusion opportunities, and building upon the mental health strategy currently under development. These staff will form a portion of the multidisciplinary team model that will assist schools to address complex needs, engage in innovative practices, and provide both proactive and reactive interventions. I'll pause here for any questions. Thank you. I have uh, Trustee Dave, Davies' question. Yes. Um, how many of these do we have currently? And is this just where we're renewing them for another year? And also, I, I do recall in the back of my head that the, we did get some special ministry funding for this purpose. And, and that is, is that where most of this is coming from? Who's going to answer that? So yeah, yeah, I'm assuming this is the guy in the child and youth care hmm? request. Is that? I see that that one has existing, that, uh, that one item. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering if we have this currently. Yes. Just so, it for another year. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because the ministry funding is from year to year. That that's why that's why they're back here as a business. Perfect. Yeah. And so when we get that presentation, we'll see that that's funded and we don't have to go into reserves or some other place. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, and I heard this uh, inkling of uh, form part of the mental strategy that's being developed. Um, when is this uh, mental, uh, uh, mental health strategy being developed? I mean, it's one of the topics in the top five that I I concerned about uh, for our students, and I think uh, the sooner, <laughs> and obviously there's going to need uh, resources assigned to it. Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Chair McDonald. The strategy is currently under development. We expect to have something to share at the next board meeting, uh, the June board meeting. We will be sharing some further information around the development of the plan around the mental health strategy. So there was an update at a previous board meeting. I believe it was the April board meeting. And so there will be a further development um, update in June and it will be launched fully uh, in the fall. Awesome, I look forward to that. Um, any questions? Okay, I see none. We can move on to the next one. Hey, this Last. is business case. Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, this is business case 1011. 
Peel Virtual Secondary School, Peel Virtual Elementary School, Behavior Elementary um, Education, sorry, Assistant. The Special Education and Social Emotional Learning Department takes an inclusive approach and through the principles of differentiated instruction, supports students in whatever setting is most appropriate for them, whether in personal or virtual. Students may be attending virtual school due to a variety of hardships related to the pandemic, to past or ongoing trauma, or due to other socio-emotional considerations. The involvement of behavior educational assistants on a consistent basis in the virtual schools will support continued engagement and access to learning, as well as developing the necessary skills to address challenging circumstances that hinder learning, providing improved self-advocacy, self-efficacy, and well-being for students. Pause after that one. If there are any questions about the Peel Virtual and Elementary uh, Secondary School Behavior Educational Systems, the request is for two. I see none, so we can move on to 1012 of the CPI booklets. Certainly, thank you, uh, through you, Chair. 1012 is Crisis Prevention and Intervention Booklets and providing supports to students with extremely complex needs, it is essential that staff receive the necessary training to support, the, to support in the safest manner possible. In consultation with the Joint Health and Safety Committee, CPI training continues to be provided for staff with an emphasis on prevention and de-escalation strategies. The booklets represent a consumable resource that participants in the training are able to take with them and refer to as they engage in their daily work. Great. Here, if there are any questions, yep, happy to take questions about that one. Uh, oh yes, I have trusted you. Just a curiosity, how many booklets will $38,500 get? Each book cost $25. Oh, is it? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can we move on to the next, uh, the last one for you, I think? Yes, thank you. This is business case 1013. So through you, Chair, this last business case 1013 is Canadian Cognitive Abilities Test. And so similar to the CPI intervention booklets, this is um, a somewhat consumable resource. So this general screening assessment is administered to students in grade four. That's all students across the system in grade <coughs> four and used to provide schools and parents with information with regards to areas of strength and challenges within the student's learning profile. Data collected from the CCAT can be used to inform decisions related to <clears throat> instructional interventions, modifications and accommodations, as well as pointing to suggested leveling to ensure that teaching remains within the zone of proximal development and students engage in just right learning opportunities. The CCAT also serves as a screening tool for students accessing enrichment opportunities. A consumable assessment tool, the answer sheets must be replenished yearly and booklets need to be replaced in accordance to use and in line with the administration schedules within schools each year. And that is the uh, final business case on behalf of the Special Education Social Emotional Learning Department. Any questions on that? Um, Many years ago, I had my son tested CCAT electronically, and you're talking booklets. Is that something that we've explored? And is uh, with the software uh, computer program and answer sheets uh, be less expensive? 
Actually, um, thank you for that question, Chair. Right now, we have uh, this school year, we have piloted the NGAT assessment, which is the uh, Naglieri assessment. So there has been some consultation at the Special Education Advisory Committee meeting, some presentations and discussions of the NGAT. That was piloted for grade four students this year, not all. It was a small sample, about uh, 15 schools were uh, part of the pilot. So it was a very small sample and it was done uh, concurrently with the CCAT. So we wanted to be able to have some comparable results. So we're still analyzing the results, but the results are very positive. And right now we're in consideration for whether or not we will expand that pilot uh, next year. So we are looking at a completely digital version. The NCAT requires no booklets, requires no bubble sheets. It is entirely uh, online as an assessment tool. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that's great to hear. Excellent, well, thank you for your presentation of business cases. I, we're gonna move on. To the, the next uh, grouping, uh, we're in the facilities and uh, environmental support services. And uh, Associate Director uh, Gill, are you presenting this? Yeah, uh, no, I can go by Chan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and uh, through you, Chair McDonald. Um, I have business case 980. This business case is to implement the eBase project manager software uh, module as well as budget module. It is to currently replace an outdated software program, which we are currently using. This current software program that we're using can no longer be supported by LTSS. So we are proposing to move over to this module. We are already currently using the eBase modules for work orders, permits, and health and safety. Um, the eBase software uh, package is widely used by many uh, school boards in Ontario. And uh, the ask is for $25,000 for this module. Glad to take any questions. Any questions? Can't this be covered in your operational? You know, such a, sorry, it's such a small number. Sorry, yes. So I told you, uh, Chair, I mean, so I would say over the last uh, few years, uh, because of the declining enrollment, we've been uh, looking for efficiencies in, in all of our areas, and, right. and we have reduced uh, some of those uh, the budgets from the, the different departments. So, so I'm assuming that that department feels there's no there's, there's no, no place to place to include that in their okay. existing budget. So that's what I'm asking you. Okay, I appreciate that. Honest response. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Trustee Davies has one. This is a, a one-time. Uh, fee or was this a licensing thing that will happen again next year and the year after and the year after? Uh, through you, Chair, th this would be an annual fee that would be ongoing. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, I guess now we'll go on to next business case 981. Oh, sorry, 981. Thank you. So for our next business case 981, this is to secure funding for the non-salary component of the uh, additional spaces that will be opening at our school board, approximately 7,201 square feet of new sp school spaces anticipated to be opening. This secure funding for the non-salary component of the facilities, <coughs> maintenance and utilities associated with these new spaces uh, for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. Uh, part of this cost would include maintenance, supplies and services, facility supplies and services, and utilities. The ask is for $17,842. Glad to take any questions. Thank you, Controller Chung. Uh, do we have any questions, comments? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next one, uh, 982. Thank you, and through you, Chair McDonald. Uh, 982. This is for our uh, and ask for an increase to our snow plowing contract. This is the secure funding that we anticipate will be uh, increasing this year. The tender is currently out and about to be finalized, but we are uh, certain that there will be between a 10 to 20 percent increase in our, in our budget. This is mainly due to the price increases inflationary due to gas, salt and labor that our snow plowing contractors have incurred over the years. 
So the ask is for $500,000 for the additional uh, budget increase uh, based on that. Without taking questions. Seeing, seeing no questions, I'll move on to the next budget case of 1036. So 1036, this is to adjust our facility services and contract the service budget to reflect the price increases due to inflation over the last several years, as we are well aware. For the past several years, there have been significant increases in supplies and contracted service, particularly in facilities operation services. Several of our contracts in the past several years have increased significantly, and we expect them to increase uh, additionally as we continue with our tender processes. The request is broken down roughly into um, these amounts. Uh, $206,000 will be anticipated 10% increase for custodial supplies. $105,000 will, will be anticipated 2% increase for contracted services and $64,000, 2% increase for other supplies and services, namely other supplies for maintenance services um, for their shops and our trades staff. So the ask here is $375,000, $717, and glad to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, I see no uh, questions here. So I think we'll go on to the last one with you, I think, uh, business case uh, 976. Sure. Debbie can turn it up, sir. Good evening and thank you. Through you, Chair McDonald, um, the purpose of this business case is to request support during seasonal increase increases in workload in the uh, purchasing department. During the months of March to June, the volume of requisitions and inquiries uh, significantly increased during this time frame and exceeds uh, the capacity of our current staff level. In order to handle the surging volume of workload and meet the expected turnaround times for schools and departments, um, this temporary help is, is the way that we can only achieve this to meet the turnaround times. If we if we do not receive this, this, this type of support during our peak time, it does um, impact the turnaround time for, for POs, NCPs, RFPs to be completed in a timely manner. It also could put us in a situation where uh, we, we oversee into the next school year, fiscal year. Um, we are still experiencing supply chain issues um, and prolonged time for furniture and appliances to arrive, um, delayed deliveries, et cetera. Um, happy to, uh, oh, sorry, one additional point is that this will be the third year that we have requested this. Um, it has been approved, been approved in the past to meet these peak times, and the ask is for $20,496. Thank you, Controller. Do I have any questions? Um, you know, I, I see the need. I mean, uh, you know, we do a lot of work in the summer uh, in our schools, and you have to get it all contracted, purchase ordered out, and, and, and supply chain is a challenge. Uh, I deal with my industry uh, quite a bit, so thank you for for that explanation on that uh, business case. And I think now we'll be moving over to our corporate support services, uh, and just someone online to present that. Uh, Thank you, and through you, Chair McDonald. Uh, transportation does submit a business case on a yearly basis since uh, the transportation uh, budget is in the deficit. Uh, right now, we are uh, experiencing contract increase rates due to the contract that we have signed with our current service providers. The increase last year was 6%, and we are predicting an increase this year of approximately 5%, and this is a CPI increase. Uh, we are also um, uh, going to be experiencing a fuel cost increase simply because of the fuel prices that we've experienced over the last two years coming out of COVID. Um, in addition, we've had prior business case amounts that were entered in a one-time increase and unfortunately, it just didn't roll over from year to year. Um, so we have to ask for that same amount uh, of 3.2 million um, on a year to year basis. 
Uh, and I am happy to answer any posts. One, one more additional point. Uh, as everyone is aware, the Ministry of Education has come up with a new transportation formula because the guidelines for that, that funding have not been laid out by the Ministry of Education at this point in time. We are not sure exactly how that would impact our overall budget. They are still working on those guidelines and ensure that they will get us some more information in the next four to six weeks. Four to six weeks is past the approval time of our budget. Yes. <laughs> so the promise to give us more money, but won't tell us the guidelines to spend it. To spell it, to spend it, we'll spend it, and then they'll say, "Oh, too late." Okay, it's going to be fun. Uh, any comments or questions other than mine on this uh, this last uh, business case? That's a lot of money. I know we're getting a lot of money increase, but uh, I think there's going to be challenges with this stuff. I have Trustee Clark online. Uh, Trustee Clark. Yes, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, do we do they have any electric vehicles, or is this all uh, all, all uh, like liquid fuel? Good question. Yeah, through thanks. you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, through you, Chair. Uh, in Peel Region, we do not have any electric vehicles. Um, they, there is no funding through the, the, fund, the new funding formula for the purchase of electric vehicles. They are significantly higher cost to operate, um, although their lifespan is longer than, than a diesel bus. Um, the cost up front, the capital cost of an electric vehicle is significantly higher until such time that the ministry is willing to, to take a look at that, and they have committed to looking at that. Um, and, and rolling out probably some kind of future um, initiative for electrification. Uh, we will have to wait until such time that that does happen. And I know, okay. I think, yeah, I, I think the province of Quebec has mandated something in electric buses. I, I know my company is involved uh, with the manufacturer in, in Quebec uh, and doing electric buses and so doing all the charging associated with it. It's very interesting. Uh, situation they're doing there. That is correct. Through you, Chair, uh, the government of Quebec is funding uh, that initiative. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, thank you um, for all the presenters today. I, I can't thank you for the depth and detail that was uh, provided, as well as the, the very fulsome answers to our questions. I can't thank you enough. So, do I have someone who put, uh, first of all, before, uh, you know, let's put this on the floor. Does someone want to put this on the floor? Uh, trustee uh, uh, Joe, Joe Hall, um, and, and uh, uh, seconded by Trustee uh, Clark. There's Clark. You're on, Clark's on the committee, right? Yeah. No? No. No, no, sorry, no. no. So that's why we Trustee Davies. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, any final questions before we wrap it? Uh, Wrap this uh, 5.2 item up. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Great, thank you. So uh, we'll now move on to item six. There's no communications. Item seven, trustee motions for consideration. There are none. Uh, no trustee uh, notice of motions. And so that brings us to item nine. So who would like to put this on the floor? Uh, for uh, Trustee uh, Pramali, uh, uh, puts on the floor, or uh, seconded by Trustee Davies. All those in favor, and adjourned. Thank you very much.